Good morning. I'd like to call the meeting of the Health and Human Services Committee to order. It's Tuesday, February 21st, 2023, and a quorum is present. Uh, today we have one bill on the agenda, and it is Senate File 73. Um, just a little bit about uh, the logistics for this bill. We are going to be uh, proceeding. Uh, Senator Port will present her bill. We'll have testimony, and we'll get into some discussion and possibly amendments today. Um, we, we have to adjourn at 10.30 uh, because we have a uh, floor session coming up at 11, and so um, I had offered um, to give some more time tomorrow to the hearing. We will not include any public testimony in that portion of the hearing, but it will allow members to continue discussion and amendments and um, finish action on the bill. So we will just be um, laying it over today until tomorrow. Um, and then tomorrow is also all virtual, so we will be, um, you will be able to, to watch the hearing um, online. And so, uh, we will get, oh, and today when we have public testimony, uh, we have a lot of testifiers, and so we will be limiting people to two minutes, and would appreciate your, um, your ability to keep to two minutes so that we can get through all of the testifiers and give everybody the same amount of time. So I, I would expect that people will be respectful of the time commitment and also respectful of the other testifiers. Um, here in the room and on Zoom and um, be a respectful listener um, to the discussion today. So I would like to proceed with um, Senator Port. Would you like to um, introduce your bill? Thank good you. Morning. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Wicklin and members. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's just a little bill in front of us today. So. Um, I am really pleased to be here with you today to present Senate File 73, the Adult Use Cannabis Legalization Bill. Prohibition of cannabis is a failed system that has not achieved the desired goals and has had incredible costs for our communities, especially for communities of color. We have an opportunity today to continue the process to undo some of the harm that has been done and create a system of regulation that works for Minnesota consumers and businesses while ensuring an opportunity in this new market for communities that have been most affected by prohibition. Our main goals with this bill are to legalize, regulate, and expunge, and we're working to ensure that it does just that. This bill establishes an Office of Cannabis Management to oversee the regulation of cannabis and transfers the medical cannabis program to that new office. It establishes a Cannabis Advisory Council, requires specific studies and reports, and sets up a statewide monitoring system. The bill also creates an approval process for cannabis and hemp-derived consumer products, establishes plant propagation standards and agricultural best practices, as well as environmental standards. Additionally, the bill provides legal limits for adult use cannabis products, establishes categories of licensing, and regulated fees and legal framework. We establish a social equity program to ensure communities most harmed by prohibition have an opportunity to engage in the industry, provide grower grants, and invest in a substance use disorder advisory council. Senate File 73 sets the tax rate for cannabis products, provides business development grant programs, sets up automatic expungement programs, as well as an expungement panel for higher level offenses, and puts in temporary regulation changes needed for the products we legalized last year. We also provide guidelines around testing, packaging, labeling, and advertising. This bill is comprehensive, to say the least, and will absolutely have changes from now until we see it on the floor. Over the course of this session, this bill will have many committee stops. We hope that through this process, we can work together with each other and with stakeholders to get a final product that works best for Minnesotans. Today, in the Health and Human Services Committee, the jurisdiction of the bill is laid out on sheets that you have in your packets. It looks like a lot, but I'll do my best to summarize what's covered. You can refer back to your sheets for more detail. In Article 1, this jurisdiction this committee covers the definitions related to medical cannabis, the transfer of the medical program to the Office of Cannabis Management, and the appointments relevant to the medical program to the Advisory Council. 
It lays out a study on the mental health and substance use disorder treatment system that must be completed and prohibits healthcare practitioners who certify for medical cannabis from having an economic interest in the cannabis business. It covers the medical cannabis licenses, business applications, cultivators and processors, the patient registry program, and qualifying medical conditions and the duties of healthcare practitioners. The jurisdiction also covers restrictions that can be adopted by healthcare facilities and hospices, damages that may be pursued by a patient who is discriminated against, and penalties for violations by healthcare practitioners. Article one also covers research grants, labeling requirements, and advertising. In Article 6, medical cannabis compact language with the tribes is covered, as well as education on cannabis use and substance use, the collection of data over a number of studies. It also covers the requirements that once enacted, this law protects people who would use cannabis, adult use cannabis, from being excluded from medical assistance and general assistance. Article 7 moves, to the, moves the regulatory authority for cannabinoids from the Board of Pharmacy to the Department of Health and has testing requirements, restrictions, and penalties for the medical cannabis program. Article 8 reschedules cannabis from Schedule 1 to a Schedule 3 drug. Article 9 has the appropriations, although at this time they are blank as we are awaiting the fiscal note. And through every stop for this bill, as, as is the same through every other stop of this bill, we can assure you that appropriations will not come out of this budget target, out of your budget targets, um, and they will be added and vetted in finance. I know it sounds like a lengthy jurisdiction, but mostly it's moving over what is existing law under the medical cannabis program, placing it within the new agency, and updating provisions based on adding recreational adult use cannabis to our state's market. I wanna thank the folks who run our medical programs for their continued work with us to ensure that we have a medical cannabis program that meets the needs of patients moving forward. There are ongoing conversations about some licensing aspects that will be taken up in the broader licensing conversation in state and local gov, and we're grateful for the work these folks have put in to help us get the language right in the bill. As a reminder, this bill goes next to human services. I thank the committee for your time and am happy to stand for questions. Thank you, thank you, Senator Port. Uh, first, we will move to uh, testimony of testifiers who are uh, coming to us by Zoom. And uh, the first testifier, um, again, I wanna reiterate that uh, we're allowing two minutes for each testifier, um, and we expect that people will be um, following that time guideline and be respectful of ending your comments when, we, when the timer goes off, if you're still speaking. Um, the first testifier today is Maren Schroeder. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name and begin your testimony. Good morning, Chair Wickland, Senator Port, and members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. <clears throat> My name is Marin Schroeder, and I am the Coalition Director for Minnesota is Ready, as well as the Policy Director for Sensible Change Minnesota. Over the past 10 years, I worked extensively to expand the medical cannabis program through conditions, delivery methods, and other statutory changes. We talk a lot about folks who have suffered under the current policies, and I think you'll hear a lot of testimony today to that effect. That sick Minnesotans have struggled to access and afford medical cannabis since the program went live in 2015 due to unnecessary and onerous restrictions on access. One of Senator Port's amendments today is an access provision protecting patients who are in a healthcare facility. <clears throat> Excuse me. My mom, Kathy, one of the first medical cannabis patients in Minnesota, is currently battling stage one pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. In addition to her medical her multiple sclerosis that first qualified her for the program. Under our current law, she does not have the right to keep her medical cannabis with her if she enters the hospital or later a skilled nursing or hospice facility, only that she may use it. In practice, this could mean that my father or I would have to drive to a facility to give her medical cannabis two to three times per day unless the facility chooses to allow her to store it. Not only is this a barrier for patients, it provides another unnecessary responsibility on a patient's family who, speaking from experience, already have to change their whole lives to care for their loved one. 
This amendment is modeled on Ryan's law passed in California in 2021. The story behind that law is a lot like my mom's. Ryan Bartell, a former athlete and member of the US Coast Guard who was diagnosed with terminal pancreatic cancer, was only given weeks to live and provided fentanyl for pain control, which made him constantly sleep. Ryan, who wanted to use medical cannabis instead, was rejected from multiple healthcare facilities in the final weeks of his life. After finding a facility that permitted Ryan's use of medical cannabis, he was able to be awake and communicate with his friends and family during his final days. Minnesota can follow California's lead on this and do something truly special for Minnesotans. Thank you. Ms. So today Ryan. I urge you to not only support Senator Port's amendment, but also to support SF 73 and the sickest Minnesotans you, who need us to do better. Thank you. Um, the next test fire is Judson Bemis. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name and begin your testimony. Thank you. Uh, my name is Judson Bemis and I am the co-chair of Smart Approaches to Marijuana Minnesota. I am also the founder and executive director of Gobi Support, which is an online drug and alcohol intervention program for teens and their families. In my work, over 90% of the family's contact is because their teen is using cannabis. I am also a person in long-term recovery from cannabis use disorder. Four recent peer-reviewed, scientifically published research reports correlate high-potency cannabis, over 10% THC, to cannabis use disorder and psychosis. At risk are people with a family history of mental health problems and adolescents who begin using cannabis at an early age. The current potency of weed is 18 to 25 percent, and vapes could be 70 to 90 percent. There is no current research on what 70 percent THC does to the human brain. So we would like to see a potency cap of 15 percent. I would also argue for age 25, the Star Tribune has done that for us. Um, we know other cannabis commercialization states see an increase in THC positive traffic accidents and fatalities. While it is true that THC may leave the bloodstream within a short period of time, impairment can infect the driver for two or three hours. The current saliva test will detect the presence of THC, but there is no, but there remains no roadside impairment test. The bill does not allow local communities to opt out from having cannabis businesses. Cartels are already active in Minnesota and black marketeers open stores or distribute on the streets where there are existing businesses and opportunities to easily blend in, not in communities that have opted out or don't have cannabis related businesses. The governor has promised that consumers will now be able to get safe products, but the only way to get safe products is to have robust inspection and enforcement. There is not enough money in this bill for such efforts and practically no money for communities and police forces that will be responsible for enforcing these laws. Unlike the House, we urge the Senate to slow down and take a close look at what the future might look like. This is not a benign drug, and you are Thank about you, to legalize Beas. an addictive product that will affect the health and safety of the, of the citizens of Minnesota. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next testifier is Angela Dawson. Good morning, and uh, thank you, Chair and Committee. My name is Angela Dawson. I am a fourth generation farmer and founder of the 40 Acre Cooperative and the Great Rise. The Great Rise and 40 Acre Cooperative both fight for social equity within the agricultural space. And uh, at the 40 Acre Cooperative, we use hemp and cannabis as an economic tool to create more equity for our farmers. Um, I have been uh, learning and growing uh, hemp and have been able to create a business here in northern Minnesota that has supported up to five families for the past four mm -hmm. years. Uh, also, I am married to my husband is a veteran and has used medical cannabis to uh, help with his symptoms from PTSD and also pain in his back and neck from jumping from planes uh, during combat. Uh, seven years ago, my husband and I were looking for natural remedies for uh, his pain and for his, his symptoms. So we traveled to other states around the country to learn about how cannabis was grown uh, and used by farmers. And we learned much about some of the healing uh, properties and was able to help some of his symptoms. 
Uh, before we were able to use cannabis uh, for his symptoms, he was being prescribed very heavy narcotic drugs um, that not only made him sick and had serious side effects, but also never really addressed his original condition. So it is because we were able to travel to other states and learn the healing uh, components of cannabis that we were able to actually turn it into a vocation that could support him in his retirement and also uh, create economic opportunities for people who are also um, short of opportunities here in northern Minnesota. Uh, I support the bill that Senator Port has uh is in the amendment that Senator Port is presenting. Um, we believe that um, equitable access to cannabis is something that Minnesota is ready for, and uh, I support the bill. Seven years ago, um, we thought that this was only a dream, and we are happy to be a part of the community that is uh, not only being uh, responsible with the way that we grow and cultivate the plant, but also offering uh, healing opportunities for our communities. Uh, thank you, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Um, next testifier is Johanna Lester. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Please state your name for the record and begin. My name is Johanna Lester. I'm a retired piano teacher and research interviewer in public health at the University of Minnesota and also a single mom whose family was destroyed by my son's marijuana use, which started about the age of 13, and his death at 22 in a fatal car accident. I am here in opposition to the legalization of marijuana and to ask, what kind of state do we want to have? Cigarette smoking is responsible for more than 480,000 deaths per year in the U.S., the annual health care costs in Minnesota directly caused by smoking is $2.92 billion. Marijuana is usually smoked and contains many of the same carcinogens as tobacco. In addition, marijuana affects memory, perception, and motivation. This bill sets Minnesota, the state of Minnesota up essentially as a pharmaceutical and dispensary system which targets the already disadvantaged communities and adds to their disadvantage. The estimated cost for setup alone is $60 million. This is for a recreational drug that does not promote health. What would happen if we used that $60 million to set up a research program to end cancer or medical clinics in underserved communities or grocery stores in food deserts or tutoring and reading so that all of our children can read? Do we really want to sell the health of our communities for marijuana tax dollars? The question I ask again is what kind of state do we want to be? Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next testifier is David Benson Stabler. Thank you very much. I'm speaking as a lobbyist for SAVE, a Minnesota C4 organization, and a association, the Minnesota Anti-Narcotic and Anti-Addictive Drug Coalition, lobbyist for both. When Colorado legalized recreational marijuana, it was supposed to be an experiment in the American laboratory of 50 democracies. Other states were supposed to observe and note the results. What we see is four times more use of THC quantity adjusted for population growth and no detriment to the illicit trade in cannabis. In California, the illicit trade is clearly ballooned the California representatives associated with their cannabis board estimate that illegal sales are still 80% of the industry in California as of 2019. The theory that there is a end of prohibition benefit is clearly not supported by facts. The health harms are clear. The medical, Minnesota Medical Association President Nichols warned in a Star Tribune article to the legislators 
that seven clear harms would result to public health from this bill. Many folks are warning today about particularly acute harms, but clearly recreational use would increase cannabis use in Minnesota, which would bring about myriad harms and health harms specifically. It would bring limited benefits to certain industries, the selling of cannabis itself, but also casinos, hotels, certain frivolous products, et cetera. There clearly is a health harm that would be caused by this legislative act. The regulatory framework is un infeasible. I appreciate that uh, Senator Port acknowledged that there is a risk that is that they are realizing that of this infeasibility. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And uh, last testifier on Zoom is Ken Winters. Thank, thank you. you. Chair and members of the Senate committee, thank you for allowing me to testify in opposition to Cannabis Bill SF73. I am Ken Winters, a longstanding drug abuse researcher with 25 years of it, while a behavioral scientist and professor in the medical school at the University of Minnesota. I co-founded Smart Approaches to Marijuana Minnesota, which is the state affiliate to the national group. I am very knowledgeable about the research and science of cannabis use and health. I understand that at least one survey showed that more than 50% of Minnesotans favor legalizing cannabis for commercial sales. Yet would that many Minnesotans have answered this way if they had an accurate picture about cannabis use and health issues based on decades of research? Do most Minnesotans know that use of high potency cannabis increases the likelihood by three to fourfold of developing a psychotic disorder? that high potency THC can break the brain and impair the user's ability to learn and make decisions. That expanding commercialization will lead to significant increase in fatal car accidents linked to driver THC impairment as shown by very rigorous data from Colorado and Washington state. And that expanding commercialization will increase the prevalence of those meeting a cannabis use disorder among adolescents and young adults as methodologically sound studies from commercialization states have demonstrated and based on the science uh, rigor fact that the developing brain is very vulnerable to the effects of THC. SF73 has many features that intend to address public health concerns, yet several adjustments are needed. My colleagues and I have assembled some critical ones. Why not allow communities to opt out of allowing dispensaries? Why allow the composition of the management board of 27 members to have only one member who is required to be an expert in addiction prevention and treatment? The bill's inclusion of a separate group, the Substance Use Disorder Advisory Council, is only given an advisory role. Thank you, Mr. Winters. Can you please um, wrap up your testimony? And thank you for listening to my points of view. All right. Thank you. Thank you to the testifiers on Zoom. Now we will move to in-person testifiers. And I would like to have um, three people come up to the table at a time so that we can move from one testifier to another more quickly. Um, after you finish your testimony, you certainly you don't need to stay at the table until all of the um, others have completed their testimony. But if you wish to, that's fine too. Um, the first three testifiers we would like to have come up, um, Governor Jesse Ventura, Samantha Lee, and Jess Hauser. And when you're at the table, if you could please sign in on the, the sign-in sheet, I would appreciate it too. Welcome to the committee, Governor Ventura. Thank you. Great to be here. This is actually the second time I've testified now. I testified a couple weeks ago. <clears throat> but I want to get to the issue because I'm only allowed two minutes. But I want to also let the committee know that <clears throat> the governor's never late. Everyone else is just early. So if I go over two minutes, slightly bear that in mind. Okay, uh, I'm here to testify on two folds to, so in support of this bill. First and foremost, I tried to do it 20 years ago. I was the initiative that got you even talking about it today. So it's, I feel great that I am still alive. 
to see that this bill could pass and become law. Now let's see, go to the reason I'm here. <clears throat> I'm here because of cannabis saved my life. Saved my life. Not me personally. It saved the first lady, the 38th first lady of Minnesota, about 10 years ago, developed late in life seizure disorder. My wife of 47 years was seizing two to three times a week. And I'm dead serious on this. These seizures were nothing to laugh at. You hold the person, you're helpless. You make sure they're breathing and they don't swallow their tongue. Two to three times a week, my wife is doing this. We went to the doctors. They put her on one seizure medicine. Didn't work, horrible side effects. A second seizure medicine. Didn't work, horrible side effects. A third seizure medicine. Didn't work, horrible side effects. A fourth seizure medicine. Did not work, horrible side effects. In desperation, I have a home in Mexico and friends in Colorado. We drove to Colorado and I'll add, she had a seizure the night before we got to Colorado in the motel. We got to Colorado, our friends had the legal cards, they went and illegally bought for her three drops under the tongue. I can tell you from that day forward, my wife, the First Lady of Minnesota, has not had a seizure since. Now, what did it cost me? They had to send me illegally the marijuana from Colorado to Minnesota. I broke the law. But in this case, it was a choice. My wife or Minnesota law. And in the words of Dirty Harry Callahan, the law's wrong. That's what I had to go through, my family. She's been on medical marijuana since. When it got legalized here, she was one of the first to get it and she's now in pill form, but here's the problem. It is so restrictive in Minnesota, it costs $600 a month. Healthcare won't pay for what works. They'll pay for all this crap that didn't work, all the drugs that didn't work, that didn't stop the seizures, but they will not pay for what works, and that is the cannabis. She now gets it from Minnesota at 600. It's now dropped to 300. Why? Because you've expanded. It'll drop even more using capitalism. That's what happens. When there's competition, price goes down. Now, there's talk, I've heard these experts about the age. Let me say this, tell you this. Why do you think government is so hated today? They're hated because of hypocrisy. And this is a, a great one I'm going to hit you with here. I suffer from post-traumatic stress today. You know what it's from? I'm a Vietnam veteran. Because at 18 years old, I went in the United States Navy. At 19 years old, I was trained in the most physical we have in the military. That is the United States Navy SEAL team. I then deployed at age 20 for nine months in Vietnam and Southeast Asia. I came back from deployment 20 years old. I had been back one week. True story. I went into my executive officer and I demanded to be sent back to Vietnam immediately. He told me you can't. Navy regulations say you have to spend at least six months out of the combat zone before you can go back into it again. Then he asked the question, what's the problem? I said, the problem is this, sir. I said, over in Vietnam, I'm a man. I come back home to my country and I'm a child. I can't go up on Orange Avenue and drink a beer. I can't even vote for who sent me to Vietnam because this was 1971, and it was a 21-year age voting rule then. So I was a child sent to war. Isn't that child abuse? Our country, you're acknowledging, and you got these experts, oh, marijuana, they can use it at age 25. Well, my news for you is this. If you're old enough to go kill for your country or potentially die for your country, you're old enough to smoke a joint. I hope that sets in this double standard that we have here on age. Pick an age of adulthood.
And if you're old enough to die for your country or go to war for your country, you're sure as hell old enough to be granted the privileges of an adult, and it still exists today, this hypocrisy goes on today. You're talking about an age limit of 21 or 25, yet you can go kill for your country at 18, can't you? Isn't that child abuse then? If we're not adults, we're children. I can think of nothing worse other than sexual abuse than sending a child to war. And that's what happened to me. I got sent to war and then my own country called me a child when I came home. I remember I looked at my executive officer and said, sir, I'm not a child anymore, I'm a man. And I wish my country would treat me as such. After all, they sent me there, didn't they? Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony, Governor. Um, next, we will hear from Samantha C. Lee. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Samantha Lee. I'm a pharmacist and a clinical toxicologist, and I'm currently the director of the Minnesota Poison Control System, located within Hennepin Healthcare System. For the past 51 years, the Minnesota Poison Control System has served all Minnesotans by providing free, confidential, and professional medical information and advice over the phone through our poison helpline, 1-800-222-1222. I brought a stack of magnets for everyone to take with them. Our calls are answered 24-7, 365 by specially trained pharmacists who are nationally served by poison specialists. And Minnesota residents and healthcare providers call the Poison Center for a wide range of um, advice on wide range of exposures from medications, cleaners, plants, and more. And we help provide safe management of exposures at home with follow-ups or sets to need to go in, which we can keep over 90% of homes calls from unnecessary visits to a medical facility to save time, money, and resources. We also provide education outreach to schools, first responders, firefighters, and we provide trainings for medical and pharmacy trainees. Um, the Poison Center serves as a real-time surveillance system for the state on acute poisoning exposures. We have seen a significant increase in cannabis-related exposures over the past few years. As you can see in figure one, one of the packet, calls related to edible cannabis exposures increased by more than 400% from 2020 to 2022, especially in the young children with a quarter of those edibles in kids five and under. For kids who get into cannabis, we are worried about extreme sedation and slowing of breathing, which may result in a hospital for these kids. We anticipate this trend will continue to increase based on observations from other states uh, who have legalized cannabis, as you can see on figure three. We are closely connected to all poison centers across the country, and we have been learning from states that have gone before us. The Minnesota Poison Control System recommends additional funding for increased staffing due to call volume and also for future cannabis exposures as it becomes widely available. Funding will help with prevention education for outreach healthcare providers and also for texting online messaging for those who do not want to call to obtain, way of obtain help more discreetly. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. The Minnesota Poison Control System is here to serve the needs of all Minnesotans. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, now, Jess Hauser, please state your name and, and go ahead. Uh, my name is Jessica Hauser, and I am a resident of Woodbury, Minnesota, and a member of uh, the Board for Sensible Change Minnesota. Um, thank you, first of all, to all the lawmakers, patients, caregivers, consumers, um, and folks working really hard to improve cannabis laws in Minnesota. Um, my son Wyatt was the first patient registered with Minnesota's medical cannabis program. He's 10 years old and participated in the program for seven years. <clears throat> medical cannabis was an important part of his treatment for a rare form of epilepsy um, called lennox Gastau syndrome. I was really moved by your testimony about your wife, Governor. Um, it kind of got me right here. Um, we left the program when he, we were able to transition him to Epidiolex, a cannabis medication that is covered by our health insurance, um, which is really rare, and it's only, it only covers patients with, these, with two rare types of epilepsy. Um, access to the Minnesota Medical Cannabis Program helped improve his quality of life and is a safe and effective option for children with seizures and many other medical conditions. While I'm very supportive of SF73 for a variety of reasons, I want to ensure that children 
uh, who are currently medical cannabis patients continue to have access to high quality cannabis products and that it is easier for families to choose and access medical cannabis as a treatment for pediatric patients in the future. Um, it's a beneficial treatment option for everything from autism to epilepsy to chronic pain and more, not only for adults, but also for kids. Having reliable cannabis-based therapy is an important option for parents as, it a, as it's a treatment with a low profile of side effects and may be more readily available when we see pharmaceutical shortages as we have in the past year. To help ensure the voice of pediatric patients are represented in this new law, as this new law moves forward, please ensure that a parent or caregiver of a pediatric patient is included in the advisory board to the, <clears throat> excuse me, to the Office of Cannabis Management. There needs to be a clear legal path to access for patients that are under 21. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. Um, I'd just like to add one other thing I forgot. Governor? I've used cannabis and I've used alcohol. And I want to assure you, my behavior is 10 times worse on alcohol than it ever was on cannabis. I only recall two bad decisions I made on cannabis. I went and saw Jimi Hendrix and I went and saw Janis Joplin. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for joining us today. And thanks for your testimony. Um, next, I would like to call up Kayla Fearing, Randy Backus, and Amber Shimpa. And again, when you're at the table, if you could please sign in. And um, if Kayla Fearing could begin her testimony, please state your name and, and present. Good morning, Madam Chair. My name is Kayla Fearing. F-E-A-R-I-N-G, um, and good morning, Senate Health and Human Services Committee. I'm a small business owner of Healing Fear Consulting, which specializes in healthcare science-based cannabinoid education. I have been a healthcare worker for 15 years. The last three years, I have worked in Michigan and Illinois' cannabis markets. I've learned a lot from the Midwestern cannabis states, but most importantly, that cannabinoids need to be incorporated into all medicine. My educational background is in kinesiology, and ironically enough, with minors in pre-addiction studies and leadership at the University of Minnesota. I have also completed my St. Paul Fire Department Emergency Medical Services Academy in 2014. I'm also a daily cannabis user. I'm a Michigan medication patient um, on their program, even though I was born and raised in St. Paul, Minnesota. I don't qualify for Minnesota's cannabis program. I've had three reconstructive surgeries on my leg, and I've also had a third of my right lung removed all before the age of 30 years old. Amongst other mental health diagnoses, I've only been ever offered opioids by Minnesota physicians. These are the reasons why I smoke cannabis, is all my diagnoses, and this is also why I moved to Michigan to get on their program. I smoke up to a gram of cannabis concentrate a day. Every body is different, therefore everybody's medication needs to be treated as such. I have, hold no licenses currently as a healthcare worker, and that's why I chose to come testify today to make sure how important it is that cannabinoids are included in healthcare. The last dispenser I worked at was 25 minutes west of Detroit, and we had an extremely conservative population, but still served over 1,400 people a day, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. A lot of these people weren't seeking recreational cannabis, even though they were shopping on that side. They were seeking their medication. About 30 people a week just at my shop were Minnesotans traveling for their medication who did not qualify for the Minnesota program. Again, this is all so they could access their own medication. The patients I serve in my business are those that are athletes, autism, um, Alzheimer's and dementia, and addictions, especially alcoholism and opioids. I really hope that the health committees can help end the stigma and cannabinoids and cannabis products. All cannabinoids need to be included with patients or two patients, CBN, CBG, CBC, THCA, et cetera, anything that is naturally occurring in the plant. Thank you. Can you? Can I say one last thing? One, one okay. short thing. And to quote Governor Ventura, Ventura and Dirty Harry, if it's against the law, the law is wrong. THC is in the word healthcare, so I would really like the healthcare committees to end the stigma on THC and cannabis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, next, we have Randy Backus. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Randy Backus, and I am here in opposition to Senate File 73. 
My wife, Heather, and I are the parents of a forever 21-year-old son who died because of cannabis-induced psychosis and completed suicide on July 17, 2021. I'm here on behalf of Minnesotans that deserve better for all families and loved ones struggling with addiction and mental health that are fearful to come forward. Unlike those pushing the bill, we do not have a financial interest. The personal interest we have is from firsthand knowledge and then learning about what today's cannabis, marijuana, and THC really are. The potency is incredible. The effects are enormous. When THC comes in the brain, it disrupts brain development. Why is this important? Because the brain's not developed till age 25. It's scientifically proven the high potency THC damages the developing brain, causing anxiety, depression, psychosis, and suicidal ideation in teens and young adults. Three out of 10 cannabis users develop cannabis use disorder. In 2021, 30.7% of 12th graders reported using cannabis in the past 12 months, with 20.6% of them using it in the past month, and 6.3% of them being daily users. Our youth are already struggling. Mental health systems are overwhelmed. Do you want to normalize a psychoactive drug that is that is addictive, causes anxiety, depression, paranoia, psychosis, and if eventually not stopped, it can lead to cannabis-induced schizophrenia. Is Minnesota prepared for the need and demand for human services that will be needed for legalization? Legalization will make it more accessible as you think legal, legal equals safe. Many will suffer terrible effects of normalization of cannabis. Think about your loved ones. Please use your hearts and your minds and vote with your conscience. We can do better. And one last point, <clears throat> all the people that are here speaking today that I've heard, <clears throat> one resounding thing is medical cannabis. We already have that. Fix the program, expunge the records of, of the criminals or have criminal past with this, and move forward, make that medical marijuana better. We don't need legalization of cannabis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And now, Amber Shimpa, please state your name for the record and begin. Madam Chair and members, my name is Amber Shimpa, and I'm the CEO of Virio Health Minnesota, uh, one of the two medical cannabis licensees. For the past eight years, it's been an honor uh, to lead our team while serving over 40,000 Minnesota patients with care and compassion. Although there are positives in this bill, we do believe it falls short. Uh, first, the bill would terminate our medical license on July 1 of 24, and it does not offer a reasonable path to protect our current and future patients from disruptions to their care after July 1 of 24. And second, the bill limits growing space for medical cannabis. We currently have more than double the bill's proposed space to meet the needs of our current patient base. And third, the bill bars medical cannabis companies from growing, processing, and dispensing. No other state in the country bars vertical integration for their medical program because it would result in higher costs to patients. If vertical integration is barred, Vero would be forced to wind down our operations, and we employ more than 200 Minnesotans, many of which are 1189 UFCW union members. We also believe the bill should establish an adult use program that provides safe, quality tested cannabis at affordable prices to combat the illicit market. The bill falls short here. First, the bill requires that medical and adult use cannabis be grown and retailed separately. No state in the country does this. Pursuing this path in the Minnesota program will make it easier for the illicit market to thrive and increase costs in the legal market. And second, the bill significantly limits or prevents our participation in adult use, which is nonsensical if the goal is to effectively and efficiently implement a successful program. The bill should aim to create an environment where all of us stakeholders can contribute to a safe and successful program, and it's not a zero sum, and this current bill has a reasonable chance of putting us out of business. Let's be stewards together and build a program that supports emerging diverse cannabis entrepreneurs and longstanding Minnesota business. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shimpa. Next, Dr. Carter Kazmier. And we'll also call up Stephen Egan and John Hausland-Layden. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed.
Good morning. Let me first thank the members of this committee for their attention to the very important matter of cannabis legalization. My name is Carter Kasmer and I'm a physician specializing in emergency medicine. I've cared for acutely ill and injured patients in some of our region's largest, busiest medical centers in addition to rural critical access hospitals across our state. The nature of our work demands that we are experts in recognizing and treating medical emergencies. You may be asking yourself, what do these physicians think of the threat posed to the community by cannabis use? And the short answer is, we don't. We simply don't have time to worry about patients ingesting a plant devoid of any real toxicity and which requires no antidote in the uncommon instance that an individual's overindulgence drives them to seek medical attention. We're far too busy caring for patients suffering from the acute effects, accidents, injuries, and myriad chronic illnesses that accompany the use of legal, widely abused drugs such as alcohol and the public health crises posed by opiate and methamphetamine addiction. We do, however, worry about the manner in which our most vulnerable patient's health is compromised by barriers to obtaining housing and employment in the form of prior convictions for nonviolent crimes, including possession of cannabis. Consider the many ways the communities you serve, and particularly the minorities within them, are harmed by a poorly informed status quo that makes criminals out of thousands of otherwise law-abiding citizens. Is this the future that you envision for our state? Under federal law, cannabis remains classified as Schedule I, equally dangerous as heroin and more dangerous than cocaine, methamphetamine, and prescription opiates and sedatives. The error in this classification is glaring and immediate, and to anyone in the medical community, the credibility of those who believe this to be true is questionable at best. Please use this opportunity before you to demonstrate that you will not be swayed by misinformation and that you are capable of instituting the sensible and progressive policies around cannabis legalization that majority of citizens in our state clearly desire. Cannabis prohibition has failed. What we need are elected officials unafraid of taking bold action to fully legalize cannabis. We need healthcare professionals who possess the requisite knowledge to guide their patients and the public in using cannabis responsibly. And we need citizens to embrace safe use practices, including safe storage of cannabis products away from children. I come before you today as one of the vast number of medical professionals who support the full legalization of cannabis in our state. Let us move past the fear and ignorance that has defined cannabis prohibition, and let's commence with building a more just, healthy, and prosperous future for all Minnesotans. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Mr. Egan? Who's going to introduce yourself? Yep, proceed. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, members of the committee, John Houseladen, President of the Minnesota Trucking Association here, testifying in opposition to Senate File 73. I want to focus on workforce impacts today. We have a workforce of professional truck drivers who are mandated to be tested uh, per Department of Transportation regulation. And what I can tell you is when people turn positive, the rehabilitation process is real and costly, and it will be an impact that the Minnesota uh, citizenry, workplace, and government will face. When a person tests positive for uh, any drug, but in this case could be cannabis, the rehabilitation process takes them out of their work and they are now on their own to go through a rehabilitation process, engaging mental health counselors, medical doctors, and working to get a process in place and completed so that they can test clean so they can get back into their work. The question is what resources will be in place for these workers that will now be facing this because we know, as we've seen in other states, that when cannabis is legalized, the incidence of positive tests goes up greatly. The trucking industry has lost workers to this. We will work, lose workers to this, as will every DOT-related mode. Air, rail, water, transit, school bus. These are real impacts. One of the questions we ask as you take a look at the financial conversation is, Will the fiscal note look at not only the direct costs, but the indirect costs of the system? We believe that mental health providers, medical doctors, and the systems need more direct funding to address the increased growth of the issues that they will face that you've heard testify about earlier today. In Colorado, we have seen data that shows that for every $1 of taxes collected, the state is spending $4.5 in ancillary expenses system-wide to address the cost and the problem. Our question to you is this. Have we really learned the lessons from other jurisdictions? Have we really learned what is the rush to dispute and fight against the data that's out there rather than to synthesize it, sort it together, and do this right? What is the hurry? Have we really learned the lessons? Thank you. Thank you. And now, uh, Stefan Egan, 
and I thank, apologize thank, if I mispr mispronounced your name. It's, uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Committee. My name is Stephan Egan. Uh, I come before you in favor of the bill. Uh, I am a five-time combat veteran uh, serving in three named operations for the Joint Special Operations Command with the uh, United States Department of Defense. Um, I was injured multiple times during my deployments, uh, shot once and concussed multiple times, resulting in five traumatic brain injuries uh, that left essentially six open lesions on my brain. Um, I went through the process of retiring out of the military and receiving the standard VA concoction of pills uh, that resulted in me receiving 4,500 uh, opiate pills annually, which comes down to 12.5 individual pills per day of opiates, ranging from uh, extended release to immediate release opiates. Uh, during that time, uh, as you can imagine, I developed an insane dependency on these pills. Um, which then led to intravenous addiction and all this other um, crazy whirlwind of life. From that moment, uh, I, I moved to Colorado and learned what this plant's capability was and have since dedicated my life to the science and research of this plant and now provide a, a income and a living uh, based off the science, research, and development of cannabinoids and extraction refinement equipment. Had it not been for this plant, I, I would not be here today. Had it not been for this plant, my brothers and sisters in arms would not be here today. That number of 22 veterans per day would be exponentially higher um, if other states within our country hadn't provided access to this plant. Yes, we do have a medical program. However, that medical program has priced out countless veterans that are living on a sustained budget monthly, and it's, it's just not accessible to the common folk. Um, Governor Ventura kindly mentioned that his, his wife was spending $600 per month for pills or tablets pre presented to them or provided to them by the medical program. That's not to say that other applications or delivery methods are, not, are needed for other patients, which ranges, gets up to amounts of $4,000 per month depending on what your delivery requirements are. So I please urge you to consider this bill. Uh, and provide access to all the patients and uh, people in the state that, that really need it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. And now um, I'd like to call up Trent and Jane Mar Mayberry, <clears throat> excuse me, and Ray Hicks. Welcome to the committee, and please um, please take time to sign in at some point. And um, Trent or Jane, um, Mayberry, whoever wishes to go first. Good morning. My name is Trent Mayberry. I'm here with my wife, Jane Mayberry. Thank you for allowing us to share our story. Unfortunately, this is a tragedy about how cannabis, a supposedly harmless plant, led to our daughter, Catherine Mayberry's death at the age of 24 last October. Catherine was a perfect kid up until age 18. Honor student, worked two jobs as a teenager, including being a lifeguard, played varsity tennis, rec softball, founded a badminton club, played piano, and won awards for her artwork. In 2016, at the age of 18, Catherine went off to college and was never the same. Over a two-year period, Catherine began regular use of cannabis. She dropped out of college, her personality changed, and she became withdrawn. She was no doubt addicted to cannabis. She then experienced her first episode of psychosis in the fall of 2018 at age 20. At that point, Catherine's brain was permanently damaged from cannabis use. She was in a catatonic state and was admitted to inpatient facilities at Fairview and Regions. Over the next four years, Catherine suffered from continuous auditory hallucinations, delusional thinking, slowed mental capacity, and extreme anxiety. Antipsychotics did not help her because they aren't effective at treating cannabis-induced uh, psychosis. She lost all her friends, her prospects for college and career gone. She lived in a 24-hour staff subsidized housing development, and even menial work was too much for her. Yet she continued to use cannabis and began self-medicating with alcohol and harder drugs. In October of last year, Catherine died from an accidental drug overdose of meth laced with fentanyl. My wife and I saw firsthand how cannabis destroyed our daughter's life. Permanent psychosis is worse than death. You all have to realize that. Please add the following guardrails to your bill. One, require package warnings 
that inform the consumer cannabis use may cause psychosis, which may be permanent. Two, require an age restriction of 25. And three, require a THC potency cap. Again, thank you for allowing us to share Catherine's story. Thank you for sharing. Ms. May Mayberry, did you wish to testify as well? No, okay. Thank you for sharing your story. I'm sorry for your loss. Um, now, uh, Ray Hicks, please state your name for the record and begin. I'm Ray Hicks. I'm a parent. This is a pic picture of my family 21 years ago. Jay was three and a half years old. Kyle was two and a half. Uh, they were both special needs children that we adopted from South Korea. On the back of this same thing is a picture of gray, Jay's grave marker. Cannabis played a significant role in his death. Jay had mental health issues that worsened as he grew. He suffered from borderline personality disorder. We sought much help for him, yet it got worse in middle school. His cannabis use increased then. Mental health episodes became frequent and intense. Academic performance declined sharply. Self-medicating is common to people suffering mental disorders. Jay turned to cannabis for this purpose. The effects on him were devastating. Cannabis harms brain development even into the 20s and has serious effects on mental health. Cannabis didn't help Jay's problems. It led him to deadlier substances. On June 3rd, 2019, he also had an accidental death at age 21 from something laced with fentanyl. Cannabis is not safe for human consumption, as some claim. It may relieve some symptoms briefly, but it worsens many conditions dramatically. It damages brains, especially among our young. It greatly increases the chance a person will turn to more dangerous substance abuse. This bill legal or legitimizes non-medical adult use of cannabis. It makes cannabis more attractive to our children and young people. It will lead more people to use it. Even restricted to age 21 and up, it will be in more homes where some children will get access to it. I appeal to common sense and concern for people, especially our youth, asking you to stop this bill. Making it law will increase drug-related deaths and, and grief. If we are adults, we should act like it. Kill this bill, not people. Thank you for your testimony, and I'm also very sorry for your loss. Um, next, um, we have Dr. Dr. Jacob Merman, <clears throat> Leanne White, and Jerry Rouser, if you could come forward. Welcome to the committee, and please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Um, <clears throat> Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee, my name is uh, Dr. Jacob Merman. I am a medical director of Life Medical in St. Louis Park, Minnesota. I'm here to testify in favor of uh, the File 73 bill. I support adult use legalization because of all the <clears throat> drugs available for people's entertainment both legal or not, cannabis appears to be the safest. Uh, it's much safer than alcohol and tobacco, not even speaking of cocaine and opioids. Nonetheless, as a physician, I don't generally support using any drugs for fun, including cannabis. I certify patients for medical cannabis. I've certified around 4,000 people since, since 2015. 
I see uh, most everybody in follow-ups, and the results of treatment are very good. Side effects are rare and usually very mild. The majority of my cases are with chronic pain, PTSD, and sleep apnea. But all other qualifying conditions are also represented. Uh, pain is relieved in most cases of chronic pain. I, I actually believe cannabis to be the safest pain drug of all, including all over-the-counter medications like Tylenol and Advil. Cannabis also appears to be as effective as or more effective than opioids with none of the opioid side effects and danger to life. Many of my patients have been able to get off opioids with the help of medical cannabis. This is one of the most useful drugs I know. It helps in many different conditions. It helps people sleep better, relieves anxiety, and improve people's lives when used medically. One of the most surprising results for me was in kids with autistic disorders who improve remarkably on medical cannabis, including much better ability to learn and perform in school. Um, for this reason, we must make sure a medical cannabis program is preserved. In my experience, for the program to work for patients, proper medical oversight is required. The pharmacists as, uh, at the cannabis dispensaries do this. There are many cannabis products, and patients respond to them in different ways. Individualized approach is very important for good outcome of treatment. Thank you, Dr. Merman, if you um, could wrap up So your... we need to preserve, the, the, basically, the pharmacists at the dispensaries, and we are worried that this bill may actually make it impossible. So we need the money available for the pharmacists to actually do their work. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Leanne White, please sure. state your name and begin your testimony. Sure, Madam Chair, uh, members and of if, the committee. My can name... you talk a little closer to the microphone, sure. please? Thank you. Sure, yeah. Um, members of the committee, Madam Chair, my name is Leanne White. I live in Northeast Minneapolis. I'm here to testify about Senate, uh, Senate File 73, and I wanted to ask that uh, the state's medical cannabis program continue. Um, I am a patient of uh, Life Medical. I've been successfully treated for severe PTSD and um, mast cell activation syndrome. Uh, in 2011, I was bit by a tick while camping. I ended up with late stage Lyme and languished untreated in um, the medical community that was supposed to help heal me and suffered severe side effects by not being treated. I have constant pain. Um, my pain levels without cannabis are about a seven. Um, I use cannabis every day. I use high amounts of cannabis. I medicate before I get on my bike to exercise for 20 miles in the summertime every day. Before that, I was using a, a handicap parking pass so I could get in, out and out, in and out of my car to get my kids to school. Uh, my concern is that without safeguards put in place to ensure that the medical cannabis um, program continues in some capacity that the people who it was created to help support will be left out in the cold. These are people that have been um, in the minority but are growing. This is a chronic illness community that doesn't have the mental capacity or extra energy to go around on the internet and try and do their own research to construct some sort of effective program to care for themselves because the medical community will not. So I ask that you continue to support the medical cannabis program, the medical one. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, is Jerry Rouser present? Okay, not seeing him. Um, Jason Tarasek. And I apologize if I got your last name incorrectly there. Linda Stanton and Glenn McElfresh. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and begin. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the committee, good morning. My name is Jason Tarasek. I'm a cannabis attorney with Minnesota Cannabis Law. 
<clears throat> excuse me. It's been nearly four years since I testified in favor of an adult use legalization bill in the Minnesota Senate. It's nice to be back today under different circumstances. I urge you to vote in favor of Senate File 73. It is a well-written, well-crafted law that will be a model for the nation. I'm concerned, however, that as drafted, it might lead to the demise of Minnesota's medical cannabis program. We anticipate that the tax rate associated with adult use marijuana products will be very low. That is a smart public policy measure that's necessary to put the illicit market out of business. But even if we make medical cannabis tax free for patients, the comparatively low tax rates for adult use products might lead many patients to simply self-medicate rather than jump through the hoops of the medical cannabis program. There are currently more than 40,000 Minnesotans in the medical cannabis program. And even after we legalized adult use marijuana, many of those patients would still continue to benefit from consultations with cannabis pharmacists who tailor the medicine to their ailments. Additionally, if the medical program ceases to exist, children would no longer have access to the medicine. When I first got into this business, I was dubious about the benefits of medical marijuana. That is no longer true. I have seen that medical marijuana is real medicine and it has a profound impact on patients' lives. Something so simple as incentivizing licensed applicants to pledge to serve the medical market in addition to the adult use market might be enough to save our medical cannabis program. I look forward to continuing to work with Senator Port and the Minnesota Is Ready Coalition to tailor this bill to protect the medical program. Thank you for supporting House File 73. Minnesota is ready to legalize adult use marijuana. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Linda Stanton, please state your name for the record and begin. Hi, my name is Linda Stanton. Thank you for listening to my testimony today. You only have one brain. Take care of it. Making THC legal won't make it a safe drug. Over the decades, the plant has been cultivated so that one can get high much faster, thus more addictive. Furthermore, the THC extracted from cannabis can be 50 to 90% more potent than wood stock pot. There is no positive public health purpose for legalization of recreational marijuana. The bill moves cannabis from a Schedule I to a Schedule III drug, like taking it from a locked cabinet and putting it on a park bench. Schedule one includes drugs like heroin. According to the US Drug Enforcement Agency, these drugs have a high potential for abuse. They have no currently accepted medical treatment use in the United States and have a lack of accepted safety for use under medical supervision. Under what medical authority does the state legislature feel they are qualified to make this determination? Regulating cannabis and THC won't change the psychoactive or mind-altering properties of the drug. It will just give people the false sense that it's safe. According to medical reports, at least three preschool-age kids have died from THC poisoning. Reports show that the marijuana, that marijuana is involved in more than one of every road deaths in Colorado. I was thinking over the amount of testimony that has already been provided in the many committees. I hope you will review all of it. Police chiefs and associations, the Chamber of Commerce, Hazelden, MDs, PhDs, parents, NAMI, and community members, to name some, all either opposing or pleading for extreme caution, like setting a potency cap so people will be less likely to get addicted and become psychotic, setting cannabis apart from alcohol and nicotine by making the legal age 26 because the brain is not done developing before then, how many children need to be poisoned, how many people need to die in car accidents before we get an acknowledgement that cannabis isn't a safe drug. Stop now and vote no. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Mr. McElfresh, please state your name and begin your testimony. Thank you. Chair Brickland, committee members, and Senator Port, thank you for allowing me to speak on SF73. My name is Glenn McElfresh, and I'm co-founder of Plift, a hemp drive beverage company. It's also an honor to testify alongside Governor Ventura. A few years ago, my dad's best friend, Jim, was diagnosed with terminal bone cancer. Over the period of a few short months, he transformed from a vibrant man capable of hucking 80-pound chunks of granite to a bedridden skeleton racked with unbearable pain 24 hours a day. Jim asked me to buy him THC gummies because the gummies helped him manage his pain and delay heavy narcotics. 
Jim's cancer was so aggressive that he couldn't get a medical card before he died. And even if he did, he couldn't afford the gummies because Illinois' medical cannabis program was far too expensive for his budget. I spent $500 on gummies and Rick Simpson oil to help Jim delay hospice for no more than a few weeks. The last time I saw Jim, he thanked me for the gummies. If the current version of SF73 passes, it would make life harder for Minnesotans like Jim, who need cannabinoids to manage symptoms of chronic and acute ailments, but don't have the time or can't afford the outrageously high prices charged by Minnesota's two medical marijuana manufacturers. Hemp-derived cannabinoids are a godsend for lower and middle-income Minnesotans, especially Minnesotans of color. If the current version of SF73 passes, it will kill the hemp-derived cannabinoid market until the adult use market is established. The relevant language is subtle and could be easily overlooked, but it's there at 22.26, 27.24, and 221.3 of the fourth engrossment. If the current version of SF73 passes, nearly every single hemp-derived product on the shelves today will be illegal by the end of 2023, and you better believe there will be an outcry of Minnesotans asking you, their senators, where their relief went, when it is coming back, and why you took it away. In my prior testimony, I've relied on my cannabis industry and cannabis application writing expertise to identify issues the untrained eye might overlook. I would like to use this testimony to offer solutions. This bill must regulate hemp and marijuana separately, issue an unlimited number of licenses in every category, and only then will it be the best adult use marijuana bill in the United States. The, Minnesota, the mission of the Minnesota Department of Public Health is to protect, preserve, and improve the health of all Minnesotans. With this in mind, preserving Minnesotans' access to hemp-derived cannabinoids is public health policy. Thank you all for the opportunity to testify today, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you for your testimonial. Uh, the last two testifiers, we have Tom Evenstead and Stephanie Mulroney. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee, and I want to thank uh, Senator Port for leading on this issue. Uh, my name is Thomas Evanstad, E-V-E-N-S-T-A-D, and I'm with Public Safety Minnesota, and I testify today in staunch support of the bill. Um, I testified at the medical cannabis hearing back in 2014, and um, what I'm testifying today about is you heard somebody ask why, you know, why should we do this? Well, here's the abstract of the U.S. government pot patent. I sued then President Obama for $420 billion for in 2014 after attending the um, medical marijuana hearing and pushing back against law enforcement, which led to retaliation. I'm still suffering the effects a decade later still today. Cannabinoids have been found to have antioxidant properties unrelated to NMDA receptor antagonism. This newfound property makes cannabinoids useful in the treatment and prophylaxis of wide variety of oxidation associated diseases such as ischemic, age-related inflammatory and autoimmune diseases. The cannabinoids are found to have particular application as neuroprotectants, for example, in limiting neurological damage following ischemic insults, such as stroke and trauma, or in the treatment of neurodegenerative diseases, such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and HIV dementia. On September 6, 1988, U.S. Administrative Law Judge Francis Young declared, quote, marijuana in its natural form is one of the safest therapeutic substances known to man, unquote. No human in 5,000 years of consuming cannabis has fatally overdosed. As Governor Ventura mentioned, the worst side effects I have had of being a daily consumer of cannabis, heavy amounts, I've had 10 dabs this morning of this 90% stuff, all absolutely legal. I'm a member of the patient in the Minnesota Cannabis Program, uh, was seeing grateful, 60 Grateful Dead concerts and having a few too many tacos, perhaps a Taco Bell, and getting 10 hours of sleep, sleeping like a baby. We can't have that in the state. Safety, peace, love, and harmony. Like the Grateful Dead concerts where we all used cannabis, every one of us, including the band. Um, I urge, they haven't even been able to give the lab rats enough cannabis to kill them. So this is important to understand all this reefer madness in 2023, the doom and gloom. Some people are not supposed to be using cannabis. One in nine people may have these horrible results. Uh, the other eight or nine of us, we'd like our freedom, please. Um, the governor is right. If you could die at 18, then I want to be able to use cannabis instead of alcohol. My nephew was killed because and everybody in this room has somebody they have lost because of alcohol. So with respect, I'm asking this committee 
to ignore the reefer madness, understand that these laws are rooted in racism. Anyone who opposes you, this Evans bill said, okay, is voting for thoughts. racism in Minnesota. Thank you and God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Mulroney, please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Hello, my name is Stephanie Mul Mulroney. I reside in Northeast Minneapolis and I'm a medical cannabis patient. The start of my difficult journey began in July of 2013 when I was in a serious collision. I suffered broken bones requiring multiple, multiple surgeries over a span of two years. In addition, I underwent years of physical and occupational therapy. While trying to get physically better, I was also struggling with cognitive issues. I suffered migraines, short-term memory loss, and severe sensitivity to light and noise. I was easily confused, anxious, and could not articulate my thoughts and words. After numerous diagnostic tests, I was diagnosed with a traumatic brain injury, PTSD, as well as chronic pain and fatigue. I lived and continue to live with these medical issues on a daily basis and likely will for the rest of my life. Initially, I was prescribed multiple different strong pain medications such as Dilaudid and Oxycodone. These medications made me very sick and increased my anxiety, so I switched to over-the-counter pain medications. I began mixing over-the-counter pain medications and was taking 10 to 15 pills a day. My pain was daily and debilitating, making it impossible to enjoy a normal life. As a result, I lost my career as a computer programmer. Many days, I couldn't even get out of bed, and I sunk into a depression. And some days, I would think that I couldn't live like this, and I didn't want to be here anymore. In 2016, when intractable pain became an approved condition, um, my pain doctor encouraged me to become a part of the medical cannabis program. Only a month into using medical cannabis, my life began changing for the better. I am able to dose myself without feeling high, be fully functional, and reduce my pain dramatically. Cannabis also helps me calm my anxiety as well as control my traumatic brain injury and PTSD symptoms. Before cannabis, I was in a very dark place and felt like I had no future. To say medical cannabis has improved my quality of life would be a vast understatement. Cannabis is the medicine I need to live a normal life. Unfortunately, all of this comes at a significant price tag. I pay $200 a year to be a part of the Minnesota Medical Program, as well as $400 to $500 a month for my medicine. The cost is astronomical, unacceptable, and unattainable by most. My experience and situation motivates me to use my voice to advocate for patients that need access to cannabis that is safe, effective, and affordable. I may not be here today if I did not have access to cannabis. It has allowed me to be a wife, mother, daughter, friend, employee, and many other things in life. Other Minnesotans deserve the same access to cannabis as me. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much for your testimony. And uh, thank you to all the testifiers. Um, we've concluded the, the public testimony portion of the hearing. And now, um, I guess first I'd ask if, if members have any, um, any immediate questions that you'd like to ask of the author or uh, before we move forward. Um, there are a number of amendments that have been distributed already and we can move into those as well. I think some of them are, from, are the, the authors um, has um, amendments that you'd like to um, bring forward. But first, are there any questions that members have? I don't, uh, Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I got a, a series of questions. I don't know how you want to run this because it's almost 10 o'clock. Well, we have, um, Senator Hoffman, we have till 10.30. Um, I guess if you'd like to get your questions out of the way before we do amendments, or if they relate to amendments, we could move to those as well. So I guess I'll do some global questions, because how many stops, do you know, Madam Chair, how many stops this bill has before um, it? I believe board. Senator Port would be able to answer that question. Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Hoffman. And I think it's a total of 16. Total of 16, thank you, Ma Madam Chair. Senator Hoffman. And if one of them is, is uh, the Human Services Committee, do you know? That's the next step. All right, so what I'll, I'll save um, the conversation then. I just, a couple of things to point out. Sections 41 to 48, when you hear from the, the medical uh, marijuana folks, there's some concerns, right? Re, you, you're shaking your head. So you've heard those concerns, and I'd like to see us really work on that and specifically um, addressing the concerns that, that are coming forward, especially when Minnesota did such a great job of uh, establishing a pretty solid medical marijuana um, uh, statute. So 
And then the other one is on the uh, page 17, and, I, and, and this is, these are just questions, Madam Chair, because I'm going to take a look at this. Um, the advisory council, there's no uh, reference to people in treatment recovery or addiction, um, you know, treatment recovery or prevention in that in that council. Mm -hmm. Wondering what's the th what was the thought of that council? Because if we're talking about cannabis period. I just wanted to know the, the uh, author's um, reasoning behind the, the listed people in that council and, and not necessarily some industry folks. Senator Port. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Senator Hoffman. Um, this, this list has been sort of put together over the course of this bill, um, and we've been discussing adding folks with mental health and substance use disorder expertise, um, and I, I would be very open to that. Uh, we're also, uh, I think there are amendments today to add folks who have experience in the medical cannabis program. The goal of the advisory council is really to have folks who have experience in all of the different areas that will touch this. So I, I agree with you that the substance use disorder, both education, uh, prevention, treatment, and recovery um, is, is a needed piece on that council. Madam Chair, as a follow-up. Senator Hoffman. We established the Director of Addiction and Opioid. That's a, a global uh, person that was appointed, but Jeremy Drucker is his name. The governor, that's a position I think it would probably bode well for us to consider either somebody or, or the newly developed office that he has just as that's looking at it because that's a direct link to the governor on, on policy pertaining to the three things I just highlighted. So um, I appreciate your willingness to, to look forward on that. I look forward to your stop at Human Services. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Ebler. Well, thanks. Madam Chair, just uh, advice from the, from the right side of the uh, table here. Maybe that's symbolic too, I don't know. But um, anyway, so uh, it'd be nice if we could do the amendments in person compared to the Zoom thing tomorrow. So mm -hmm. for my comments, I'm happy to interweave them with the four amendments that I have. And so if the author wants to do hers, I think that'd be just advice. I think that would make sense. Um, yeah, that would be, it, it would be a little easier. We're dealing with papers and um, it would be easier to um, go through the amendments. Are, are your amendments ones that have been passed out? Yeah. So that, okay. Um, so maybe we could go to the amendments that you wish to cover, Senator Port, and then and then we can move to Senator Abler's. Sure, Madam Chair. Um, if we can start with uh, the A58. And um, would Senator Mann, would you move that amendment? So moved, Madam Chair. So, uh, Senator Port, do you, can you explain the amendment? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is the amendment we've been working on with the Poison Control Center. Uh, this adds in, um, in addition to uh, two licensed mental health professionals appointed by the governor to um, the the council, as we were discussing, um, a warning label that is developed by the Poison Control Center in uh, consultation with the Commissioner of Health uh, that would be required to be on all products um, and puts in there some enforcement for um, the Department of Health as well as what is now a blank appropriation. Um, we All appropriations in this bill are blank until we get the fiscal note. Those will be added in finance, but we are working with um, the Poison Control Center to make sure that this meets the needs for the education and um, the added scope of the work that they, they will likely have um, after this bill. So I, I want to thank the Poison Control Center for their work with us on this amendment. Members, any questions about the amendment? Senator Abler? Madam Chair, I'll move it, at least that way. One of my um, amendments. Senator Mann moved it. Already. Moved it, so. Oh, rats. That's fine. Thanks. <laughs> any, any other questions? No? Uh, seeing no other questions, all those in favor of the A58 amendment, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion prevails, the amendment is adopted. 
Do you have another amendment? I do, uh, Madam Chair. If we could move the A67, please. Um, Senator Mann moves the A67 amendment. Senator Port, can you describe the amendment? Yes, please? thank you, Madam Chair. This is the most complicated one, um, so I'll start here and, and go sort of as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. um, this removes uh, some restrictions that were currently on the medical program. Uh, if you had a terminal illness or cancer, you were required to meet other um, additional sort of restrictions on it. You had to have intractable pain uh, to a certain level. You had to uh, meet certain levels before you were eligible for um, the cannabis, the medical cannabis program. This puts those, removes some of those restrictions. So if you have cancer, you will be able to um, access the medical cannabis program. If you have a terminal illness, you will be able to access the medical cannabis program. We've heard from a number of patients that this is, um, it, it's difficult to get into enough appointments to get the right diagnosis, to get um, access to the kind of medic, uh, medical cannabis that they want. So um, this helps to clear that up. It also adds uh, there, that there is um, a place for patients to store um, medical cannabis if they are in hospice or long-term care. Um, we heard from some of the testifiers today that once you are, if you are moved into hospice or long-term care, sometimes the can medical cannabis that you have been on is what has been allowing you to communicate with your family uh, while managing pain. Once you are moved to opioids, it's sometimes much more difficult um, to, to maintain relationships with your family, to stay conscious um, at, at that level of pain, and this allows folks to live a fuller life. However, when they're moved into um, hospice or long-term care, there are currently um, allowable restrictions that are um, able to be put in place, including requ not requiring um, those places to have a place to store the medical cannabis. So that means that if you don't have a family member who can come and bring you your medical cannabis every four, six, eight hours, um, you can't take it. And so uh, in, in folks sometimes last moments, um, and in long-term care, this strips them of the ability to use, use their medical cannabis. Uh, the way that we've changed this is based on a California law called Ryan's Law um, that helped to sort of bridge this gap. We are willing to still work through any concerns that uh, hospitals, long-term care clinics, or hospices might have with this language, though we haven't received any to this point. Um, but this gets in the bill the address to that concern, and we will um, be happy to continue to work on that. And then the final piece is um, for child care facilities. Um, it, at the very end of it, it uh, brings into line I think it's, sorry, wrong page. Um, this is a technical change um, that the standards here for med are stricter than for adult use, and med should be the same allowable as adult use. So continue to be no use around children, amongst children, um, during hours of the daycare. But if you are using medical cannabis, outside of work while you are working at um, a daycare facility, you have to, it's not restricted, but you do have to, uh, you have to disclose that to the parents um, of the people who are uh, at your childcare clinic. That's the gist of the amendment, sort of a catch-all on significant changes to the medical cannabis program uh, that we've been working on over the last several months. Thank you, Senator Port. Uh, members, do you have any questions about this amendment and what it, what it does? Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Port. Uh, council just pointed out that there is a typo in the amendment, and I'm wondering if I can make an oral uh, amendment to the amendment. Yes, we can do that. Um, Mr. Monaghan, are you going to help us with that, or would who will help us with that? 
Uh, Madam Chair, I can help, but I need a copy of it. Uh, the uh, motion would be to amend the A67 amendment on page one, line eight. Delete patient and insert parent. Senator Port, is that okay? It Members, does, yes. um, any questions about that that oral amendment to the amendment? Okay, seeing none. Um, oh, Senator Mann moves the oral amendment to uh, to be as uh, Mr. Monahan stated. I won't restate the whole thing. Um, on that motion, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion prevails, and the amendment to the A67 amendment is adopted. Uh, Senator Mann. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just had a quick question. Uh, the, the storage piece, um, we're storing medical cannabis flower and excuse my ignorance, but how is the f medical cannabis flower consumed, or how is it used? Senator Port. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, flour is typically smoked or combusted in some way. It can be vaporized. Senator Mann. So if we're, we're storing these things in a facility, are we saying that they can be used in this way, like smoked or vaporized in the facility? Senator Port, or your testifier, please state your name for the record and you can answer the question. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Laylee Fadahi. I'm the campaign uh, director for the MN is Ready campaign. We're the state's largest and most diverse coalition of cannabis policy stakeholders that have been working to help inform uh, the policies in this bill. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Mann, um, the issue here is providing a place for storage for the materials. This does not uh, change the provisions in the law that would currently prohibit um, smoking and vaping of cannabis flower um, in most public places, but also explicitly in medical facilities. So no, this would not allow for that use um, on site. Senator Mann, does that answer your question? Or? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Any other questions about the amendment? Um, it does seem like it works towards um, a solution to the, the concerns that were brought up. I, I hope that you'll consider listening if, if other concerns about this new language come up as we, as we move forward. So. Very much, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay, um, we'll move to a vote on the A67 amendment as amended. amended. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion does prevail and the A67 amendment as amended is adopted. Do you have another amendment? Yes, Madam Chair, the A68. Senator Mann moves the A68 amendment. Senator Port, can you tell us about the amendment, please? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. We've been looking for the right committee to move this in since the bill was introduced uh, inadvertently in the first draft of this bill. Artificially and synthetic uh, were, transpo were s switched. The definitions were switched. So this flips all of the um, instances of those words back to the correct um, definition. Members, do you have any questions about this amendment? Seeing none, um, we will move to a vote on the amendment. All those in favor of the A68 amendment, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The amendment is adopted. <coughs> Do you have another amendment, Senator Port? I do. The A60, please. Can you describe what this amendment does, Senator yes. Port? Yes. 
this amendment removes the kill date for the licenses under the current medical cannabis program. Uh, this is one of the pieces we've been working on closely with the medical cannabis providers in, um, in the state. This ensures that their licenses continue. Uh, it has never been the intention of this bill to end medical cannabis. In fact, it is uh, specifically a goal of this bill to ensure that we have a continued the continued necessary supply for medical cannabis. Um, so this is one of the pieces that is necessary in moving that forward. We are continuing to work with the medical uh, cannabis providers to ensure the licensing piece gets fixed uh, before we get to stake of, but this is uh, removes that sort of referred to as kill date of those licenses. Members, do you have any questions about this amendment? Hmm. Um, seeing no questions um, on Senator Mann's motion on the A60 amendment, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Do you have another amendment? I, think I have two more. Okay. Uh, A59. Senator Mann moves the A59 amendment. Uh, can you describe the amendment, please, Senator? Yes. Uh, in a portion of this bill, there is a, a thing called a cannabis event organizer, which uh, is a specific kind of license that can organize events where cannabis is served, whether through edibles um, or potentially an area uh, that would have to be not visible from uh, the front-facing street where smoking or vaping could occur. Uh, this clarifies in the language, which was always our intent, that it must still uh, follow the Clean Indoor Air Act. In Clean Indoor Air Act. Um, it cannot be inside a place where, um, you know, smoking is prohibited, it uh, ensures that that has to follow that piece. It was always intended, but not specifically called out. So this adds that language in. Thank you. Uh, members, do you have any questions? Senator Atke? Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Senator Port, in the, on starting on 1.5 of your amendment, and it addresses prohibits the statutory or home rule charter city or county from enacting or enforcing more stringent. Um, is that also used in other parts of this bill? That statement or that clause? Um, Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I believe it is in a couple of other places. There are things that, that local jurisdictions can do um, around restricting where smoking um, specifically can occur. Um, and we, we give them sort of those provisions, uh, which, is, which is what exists here. So they're able to strengthen um, what, what already exists under uh, smoking regulations in our state. Senator Atke. Thank you, Madam Chair. And so this would allow a city, county, et cetera, to enforce smoking rules. It would just be under the heading smoking versus cannabis, right? So if they wanted no smoking in a, an area of town, they'd still be able to do that. Senator Port? That's correct. Thank you. Any other questions about this amendment? Um, I appreciate your bringing this amendment forward. I had, I had some concerns. I wanted to make sure that if cities have gone, you know, gone forward with additional um, strengthening of the Clean Indoor Air Act, um, as you mentioned, Senator Rutke, they might have a, a, a rule about parks or something um, that they've already have in place regarding smoking. And I wanted to make sure that for events, if if this type of event is set up in a place like that, that smoking would not be permitted. So I appreciate you bringing this forward. Um, on the A59 amendment, uh, members, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion prevails and the A59 amendment is adopted. And Senator Port? Thank you, Madam Chair. My last one is the A69. Senator Port, can you describe what the um, A69 amendment does? Uh, yes, Senator Mann moves the A69. Thank you. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Hoffman and I have been working on this amendment together. This ensures that prevention, treatment, and recovery are all a portion of the work that the Substance Use Advisory Council works on and that this bill helps to study and fund um, various initiatives for. Um, so I thank Senator Hoffman for his work on it. This is piece one of what I imagine we will take up uh, in your committee next week. Any, any questions, members, on this amendment? Seeing none, um, all those in favor of the A69 amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion does prevail. The A69 amendment is adopted. Um, and you have no further amendments? That's all I've got, Madam Chair. Senator Abler, can you? Well, thank you, and I appreciate the consideration of doing these today. And mm -hmm. I don't have any long speeches about any amendment, but I do have a few comments to the bill, and then I'll move into my amendments. And I, I did uh, send them down just so you could have a chance to look at them, and uh, I'll discuss the amendments later. Uh, I, um, can you hear me? I just, uh, just uh, stepped out to go to the fetal, fetal alcohol uh, group, um, and there's some just tragic stories about fetal alcohol um, that are uh, just would make you want to grieve. And so uh, every year I've, I've gone there at least a bunch of times and <laughs> stories about, you know, damages to the, the kids that the mothers didn't even know was an issue. Uh, just on a related, and they, they gave me this cool shirt um, so I can remember that alcohol is bad for babies. Turns out that marijuana is, uh, cannabis is bad for babies. According to the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, uh, there's uh, some significant ill effects. Um, just so people know that we're setting up for. I, I, um, I'm not a supporter of the bill. I respect the author's ability to bring this forward. I don't know if it passes or not. I pray it doesn't. Uh, I grieve the harm that's going to happen uh, as we now would make this a uh, casual kind of something we just do, and I'll discuss that in a bit later. But, um, but in terms of the baby, this is from SAMHSA. This isn't from me. It's, uh, fetal growth restrictions, uh, like it doesn't, uh, like the low birth weight, a greater risk of stillbirth, uh, preterm birth, which is before 37 weeks, uh, and long-term brain development issues affecting memory, learning, and behavior. Uh, it doesn't stop there. If you actually uh, have marijuana and breast milk, a lot of those uh, same things happen with the brain development because these brains are just so delicate. Um, and it, this is not casual. And to the people who spoke, uh, I've got libertarian friends, oh, let's just legalize it. And to the governor, thanks for being here. Uh, just because you're 18 and able to serve in the military doesn't mean it's a good idea for you. Um, I have not shied away from talking about a little bit about my past. I abused marijuana uh, for quite a while, uh, and I still suffer effects of that. Um, and it's not nothing. Uh, back in the 70s, Pat Kessler joked people who said they lived in the 70s, uh, they remember the 70s, weren't there. Um, it was quite a time, and it was a casual time to do all kinds of things. Fortunately, I've ordered heavier drugs. Um, I've lost some friends to, uh, to those. Uh, and uh, we all just sat around and got stoned all the time and uh, managed to, uh, to stop it uh, as I became in, a, in my professional career, uh, deciding that that was just not productive for me. Um, and this bill, in many cases, is treated as a casual step toward just legalizing what's going to happen anyway. And the author knows and the testifiers are very clear that the cannabis compounds of today are nothing like what we did in the 70s, nothing at all, uh, up to 100%. Um, and the uh, reefer madness, we, we got stoned and went to reefer madness. And we're like, oh, look at the guy with the piano. And, and so uh, we, we just thought that was hilarious. And probably it was hilarious because we were smoking such uh, impotent uh, marijuana. Um, but that is actually not a joke anymore. Uh, to listen to the testimonies uh, of the people who come forward. I didn't get his name, but the man of the Forever 21 kid. How many of those do we want? 
and talking to a mother of a, of a son who I believe was 22, um, who committed suicide as a result of psychosis. We never talked about that in the 70s. Um, it's real. And the doctors who are here testifying are something we just cannot ignore. And um, psychosis, schizophrenia, um, you know, I put a bill in with Aisha Gomez um, two years ago to decriminalize. We should not be arresting anybody at, at disparate rates. And it's ironic that in Minneapolis there's more African Americans arrested for marijuana. Like, stop it. <laughs> I mean, you're run by people who care about equity. So like, for heaven's sakes, what are you thinking? Where's the policies about that? And medical marijuana has been a godsend. The Governor Ventura, that's his whole story. Um, let's make it cheaper. Let's open up that. Let's fix that if you must. But um, So my amendments that I have are not meant to cause any harm to your project. But if you insist on doing this, can we at least cause less harm? That's my intention with these amendments. And so, Madam Chair, with, with that, I'll offer the A62 amendment. Senator Abler offers the A62, did you say? Right, yeah. Can you... Tell us about the amendment, please. Yeah, Senator. and Senator Port, these are none of these are gotcha ones. I and but the I, 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 I admit I did not read the 300-page bill. I, it didn't work on my phone like I thought it might. Just to kind of look at that, but um, and uh, many people have brought forward issues, and you're appearing to be very responsive. This just says that the uh, Department of Health should keep some records about ill effects, and I'm not. Uh, I have no ego about how it's written, but so is this something that you're willing to look into and take this for starters and work on it some more? Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Abler. Um, yeah, I think this is would be good information for us to gather and to know. Um, I'm happy to take this as a friendly amendment. Thank you. Members have any questions about the amendment? Um, seeing no questions, um, Senator Abler moves the A62 amendment. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Thank you, Madam Chair. I only Thank have you. three more. All right. Um, and Senator I sent them Abler. all down just in an effort to, you know, be as cooperative as I can be. Um, anyway, so I move the A65. Senator Abler moves the A65 amendment. Can you describe it, please? Thanks, and this may actually be more germane to the next committee, but I, um, and so I'll, I think I'll just let us talk about it and then we can work on it unless you like it just the way it is. Um, so I, I don't know your bill as well as, but the governor's bill has nothing in it for treatment. And so I presume you have your own bill working and the governor, I don't know why they did not. Um, given the testimony, you're gonna need quite a bit of treatment. So I just, I conjured up the number that 20% of the money should go to treatment. And so um, I have no idea if this is the right number, but, it's, but it should be a lot. And so, Senator Port, I'd be happy to hear your thinking on the general topic and specifically if you like. Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Abler. Um, I agree with you that this is a conversation um, we should continue to have. I, I would ask not to move it today with the 20%. I'd like to continue to have a conversation. Um, we've been very careful not to put specific um, sort of earmark specific pieces for things. Um, I'm willing to, to talk about that and also decide if it should be a direct appropriation um, instead of a percentage so that we make sure we have the money up front um, and not waiting for the program to build over time. Um, but I, I would be happy to talk with you about this and work with you on it uh, before human services. But at this time, I would ask for a no. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and um, thank you, Senator Port. This is a question, Senator Abler. Uh, uh, I would I would offer an oral amendment that, when it, or we could either bring it to the next committee. We we need to have uh, when you're talking about treatment and prevention, you got to make sure recovery. It's the trifecta of the world. So, um, talking to the author from the other body who happens to be your representative. <laughs> yeah. they're, they're still waiting. There's some, there's some other things in this bill. There's appropriations. He doesn't know what kind of dollar amounts are there, but as he's made it very clear to me that, um, that they're gonna absolutely put uh, a number in, and I guess you and I can help frame what that number looks like or a percentage. It all depends upon what a fiscal note, and I think uh, uh, Senator Port's 
point is well taken, and I know there's some other notifications of dollar amounts in here, but it, it shouldn't be in this bill. It should be, or the dollar amount should be in this bill. It should be once they figure out what the fiscal note is. But uh, if we go forward with this, if you want to do it now, then I would offer an oral amendment, or if you want to just keep the conversation a trifecta and a triadic conversation, we'd be good with that, Senator Abler. So. Senator Abler. Yes, Senator you, Atke, have a, oh, Senator Atke, did you? Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And a, a comment on the conversations related to this uh, amendment. Um, and if we're going to talk more about it uh, in human services, wonderful, because 20%, um, I feel, is way too small. My, my amendment would be all of the income because <laughs> I have yeah, researched, <laughs> yeah, I mean, do the research of other states. Um, I sat out in Colorado in a meeting this summer, and they were talking about the revenue that came in, and it wasn't enough to cover the problems that we're going to run into. Um, so, you know, we heard in testimony here earlier today, for every dollar in, four or so out, the, the numbers I'm hearing and my research is a couple years old on Colorado, but for every dollar in, it was 10 to 11 out. That's why I'm saying all, because it's going to be a serious expenditure to the state, and I want to make sure we're prepared if this does go through. So uh, we can continue that conversation when we hit the next committee. Thanks, and, it was, and Madam Chair, and Senator, Senator, Senator Report. Uh, and I, we're, I think we can still get through the other two amendments uh, before we have to get done. Um, so uh, it's my intention to withdraw it then. But I just want to caution you, Senator Port, as the author, there's a program called the North Star Gambling Alliance. Is that what it's called? They get a percentage of the uh, lottery. Uh, it's too small, but they get, they get a percentage. But even at that, they have a hard time getting the money from the department because they just don't even tell them how much it is. So uh, I think you might want to consider a percent because as it grows, you might want to make sure there's enough to keep up. So that, I'll withdraw that. Uh, Senator, the next one is Senator A64. Senator Abler withdraws the A64. Madam Chair, I'll move the A64. Senator Abler moves the A64 amendment. And this adds some more people to the, to the uh, panel. Um, and I'll listen to the Senate report about is this the right number of people to add? You already added some. Uh, some of the concerns where there's not enough people and listening, I think, it's not a complete list anyway. But what's your thinking on this one? Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Abler. I think these are good additions. I'd be happy to take this as a friendly amendment. Thank you. Any questions about the amendment? No? Um, Sen um, on Senator Abler's motion to move the A64 the motion prevails and the A64 amendment is adopted. Madam Chair, my last. Senator amendment. Abler. I'll move the A63. Senator and Abler moves uh, the A63 amendment. And so I don't know if you've had this discussion already, Senator Report. Um, I, um, I think this is, of all the amendments that you could offer on this, this is probably the most important one. And in talking to my representative, your uh, fellow author across the street, um, it's complicated. Oh, people will be so confused. You, you, you know, you can buy cigarettes when you're 21, but you can smoke them when you're 18. We already have that complication. Drinking, you got the military. Um, you know, I, the topic is not new to you, uh, but I think this neurological development thing is a big, big deal. And I um, believe that people would understand, even if we did this amendment, uh, which I hope we do, hope call it friendly like we're doing pretty well, um, then people will realize this is not just recreational sport. It is something that's dangerous and should be used with caution and you should at least be neurologically developed. So I'm happy to hear your comment. Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Abler. This is a conversation we've been having um, a lot about. Um, I, I agree with my co-author across the way um, that that we have a system set up and it's pretty well known on how to, uh, that 21 is an age at which you can buy alcohol, consume alcohol, um, things like that. It is a, and now tobacco as well. Um, it is a pretty commonly accepted age of adulthood. Um, I am not comfortable changing the age to 25. However, I will say that we have significant investments in this bill and we're having additional conversations um, around both education and warning labels. Um, we are open to um, and 
I don't think we've drafted the amendment yet, but I think it's coming in human services that we will be offering an amendment to have a warning label uh, that advises uh, no use under the age of 25. Uh, we have education programs in schools and in public, uh, sort of just in the public, um, to talk about the potential adverse effects uh, of cannabis, including uh, for, for people under the age of 25. Um, this is a thing we are taking seriously. And the thing that we have learned from other states who have gone before is that the most um, effective way to drop young people, the number of young people who are using cannabis is has nothing to do with legalization or not legalization. It has to do with education. Um, in states that legalized and states that have not legalized, um, the use among young people is up. Um, however, that is not true in states that have done significant education on the adverse effects on young people. And so that is a key piece of our um, bill. It is a piece I am happy to continue working on to make sure that it is not just, you know, a passing, like, oh, don't, don't smoke pot, it's bad for you, um, but actually invests in real useful education for young people to understand the risks associated with uh, cannabis use. I, I would love to continue to work with you on that, but I do ask for a no vote on this amendment today. Madam Chair. Senator Abler. And uh, I know we're up against the clock. I actually am going to take this to a vote. I'm not going to ask for a roll call. Uh, but I, I think that we are guaranteeing if we don't go to 25, we are guaranteeing more people who don't grow live past 21 uh, because they're going to commit suicide. We're going to guarantee psychosis. We're going to guarantee neurological harm. The doctors agree. Um, the, the Star Tribune agrees. <laughs> anyway, but anyway, so they're quoting all these people. That's, um, but this is not a random number that I just made up. <coughs> if you assert that you're listening to the testimony, it has to be 25. And so I don't know how the vote goes today, um, but it'll be discussed again in the next committee, I suppose, and probably on the floor. But if, if you really mean this is a no harm bill, that it's just gonna be great, and that people are gonna not come to peril, we have to make it 25. So with that, Madam Chair, I'll, I'll uh, wait, and you can call for the vote whenever everybody else is done talking okay. about it. Members, uh, there discussion on the A63 amendment. Senator Utke. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, Senator Abler is getting ready to, to hear the vote on this. My comment was going to be, um, and we are coming back tomorrow, but this is a health issue that should be discussed further, and hopefully some sort of a, uh, a solution is ironed out in this committee rather than even push it forward, because if it just fails now, um, the fact that there's more education or we're putting warning labels on it, I don't think that's it. it stopped anybody from drinking a can of beer that's got the warning labels on it or these other things. Education is important, but yet we've got to be most concerned about the health concerns of people. And uh, that's why I would fully support going to 25. I mean, everything shows us brain development continues up to that age. The whole works falls into place with a 25-year-old, um, and I would like to see this pass. Thank you. Senator Liskey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I want to express similar things to Senator Utke here. Uh, warning labels are, are great for those that can read and can understand what the warning labels mean. Um, things that I'm concerned about is no matter how many warning labels we put on things, people don't A, read them, as Senator Utke uh, already pr pr proposed. And the other thing is there are individuals that won't be able to read them, like young children. Um, so warning labels are great for an extent. But in this case, they, they don't solve all the problems. Um, and so in, in that case, I do support uh, the idea of trying to protect those that, that can't uh, be protected by these warning labels. Thanks. Other member comments about the amendment? Senator Port, did you have any other comments you wanted to make? Um, no, you know, I, I'll just say that um, this is a, a conversation we are taking seriously and are happy to work with people on the education components um, and that there's also um, concern that if we pushed the age limit too high that it opens up uh, an illicit market for under 25-year-olds who feel they should be 
have access to legal um, cannabis. And one of the key pieces of this and the biggest health concern, one of the biggest health concerns we have is regulating the cannabis that is in the market, shutting down the illicit market, uh, because we are seeing significant impacts currently um, where people are believe they are buying just marijuana, um, but it is laced with fentanyl or, or other um, drugs. And so having a regulatory industry is, is a critical piece of this, and shutting down that illicit market is part of that. Senator Utke, did you have further comments? If I could, uh, Madam Chair, because it's... I have seen it in the bill and was going to comment later, but being it's come up in um, on this amendment, and that is the reference to the illicit market. Statistics show us in the states with legalization, that does not change. And everything we see is, it's not going to eliminate it. It won't even slow it down. Those that are current consumers are not going to change their habits. Um, this is just an expansion. So I would like the fact of the talk around of the illicit market, I don't believe is it's going to go away at all. I don't feel it's going to change. I, I wish it would. I wish it would all go away. But, um, you know, I think that's, that's a falsehood, at least in my mind, that I would uh, like us to have in the equation, too. Thank you. Other member comments? Um, I guess for my part, I do understand the... The, the desire to change to 25. I do understand the, the brain development, the science behind it. I do have a strong concern, though, about making it a different age, and I also have a strong concern about um, the, the people who are under 25 um, being accessing a market that maybe is not then the, the regulated market, and I, I think that that does pose a, a risk. Um, I would like to see greater emphasis on um, key education points made in terms of any labeling and advertising and, um, you know, an emphasis that really brings out what we know about um, scientific evidence and the impact on, um, on people um, as they get to the age 25. Um, so I, I appreciate that that is still under discussion, and I, I look forward to seeing more evidence of that. I do think that the, the bill is um, has strong um, definitions of the type of work that we want to see the Department of Health do to create educational programming, um, and that educational programming for schools <clears throat> excuse me, as well as for um, early, you know, family home visiting uh, modules, training that spans the whole, um, you know, from childhood up. So that I, I think that that will be a very important way. My reading on this, it does um, kind of support what Senator Port had said about states where educational, educational programming was greatly emphasized that that really was very important to um, trying to address and reduce the numbers of um, kids using um, cannabis. So I expect that that should be a really strong part of our, our implementation plan and that we look going forward at um, evidence, you know, what, what are we seeing after it's implemented. So um, I, I will not be supporting this amendment at this time. Senator Mann, did you, you just... hmm. seeing that we're maybe not not fully able to discuss this amendment, and you want to take a vote on it, and I want to I want to allow um, people to be able to make a decision and vote. I'd like to, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd like to either lay the bill over now and take that question up tomorrow or, um, because we, we also do need to get to a caucus, so. Senator Abler. Um, I appreciate the discussion this bill has had and I appreciate math and counting on a committee. And I think that if there's a message that, and I'll withdraw the amendment in a moment, um, to bring it up again tomorrow if you would prefer that. Um, but I think, Senator Port, this is a big deal. 
And I think that anybody who has listened to anybody talk, who has any scientific background whatsoever, knows that this amendment is the right one. And I'm not questioning your motives or anything. I'm just saying, please listen. And don't listen to the hallway about, oh, it's going to be clumsy. Uh, the illicit market will continue anyway. Uh, but this is the state saying, go right ahead. So, Madam Chair, um, I appreciate the dialogue. Senator Port, thank you. Out of respect for you, I'm not going to uh, demand we vote today. Um, might win. That would be interesting. Um, but I think you want to, as you go, continue to work here, seriously talk to the man who has the son who passed away. Listen to the mother who had a psychotic uh, son at age 22 who death was almost a relief because of this. So, Madam Chair, with that, I withdraw the amendment. Senator Abler withdraws the A63 amendment. Um, at this time, I lay the bill over, and seeing no other business before the committee, we are adjourned. <laughs>